Hi everyone, in this lecture we will be covering chapter 10 in our microbiology textbook and we're going to be talking about parasites and vectors. So we will compare and contrast the various human parasites, describe various methods of parasitic disease transmission, uh, as well as survival mechanisms used by parasites. And then we're going to finish up uh, with a discussion regarding the neglected diseases making a resurgence in the United States and in foreign countries. As surgical technologists, we have the opportunity to give back to others through participating in medical missions. And this is a really amazing opportunity that we have. However, in many developing countries, there are the potential exposure to parasitic infections from various sources, such as mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, contaminated water sources, food that's prepared under suboptimal sanitary conditions, and so on and so forth. And so it's really important that we have an understanding of parasites from this perspective um, and of vectors as well, so that we can make sure that we protect ourselves in any and all situations. Throughout the duration of this lecture, we're going to be talking about different types of human parasites. And a parasite is an organism that lives on, with, or in another organism. And uh, so these organisms live in a symbiotic relationship that is a parasitic one, where the parasite benefits and the host is harmed. And so the parasite, or the symbiont, takes up residence and extracts nourishment uh, from the host and can sometimes even result in death of the host. And these parasites can be single-celled eukaryotes, prokaryotic species of rickettsia, helminths, arthropods, and also ectoparasites. We begin our journey by talking about intestinal protozoa, and these are examples of common human parasites. So first off, we're going to talk about um, the amoeba. Now, remember, a couple things about protozoa. They, um, their name comes from the Greek word meaning first animal. There are approximately 60,000 species of protozoa that have been identified, um, and about 10,000 of those species are harmful to animals and plants. A lot of them reside in the digestive tract of other insects and animals and help them to break down food into usable components. Um, so they can live by themselves or they can live in colonies. And when there is a situation where the condition becomes a hostile living environment, they can create a covering called a cyst. And then when the environment returns to a normal inhabitable environment, they can break out of it and um, go on doing what they do. So amoebas are also known as sarcodyna and they have two stages to their life. One is the trophozoite, and that is when they're doing what they do. They're living, they're, they're swimming around, they're reproducing, and then there's the cyst, which is the dormant stage. They reproduce by binary fission, similar to bacteria. And um, a common one that the book talks about is Entomoeba histolytica. And this is the parasite responsible for causing amoebic dysentery. And uh, so this happens when um, the cysts, the dormant stage, uh, the dormant type of amoeba is ingested in feces contaminated water. And uh, then it is spread person to person uh, through anal intercourse, um, can also be through contaminated food and water. Um, so these uh, parasites produce a cytotoxin that allows them to break down mucosal tissue of the uh, intestine, and that's how they invade the 
body of the organism. Uh, this causes inflammation of the digestive tract, hemorrhage, bloody diarrhea, and uh, it can also cause a secondary infection as well. And um, so one of the symptoms that um, is concerning is extreme dehydration. It can also infiltrate the bloodstream and the lymphatic system and invade other organs of the body besides just the digest digestive tract. It can also um, move into the liver and it can cause hepatomegaly of the liver as well. Um, for most of these, the way that we diagnose them is through examining a fecal specimen. So let's talk about flagellates. As we have learned, flagellates have long whip-like extensions that help them to move around. And a couple common ones are uh, Giardia lamblia and Dianton amoeba fragilis. And uh, both of these, I believe, are found worldwide. And um, they, uh, Giardia is commonly found in streams and lakes. And what happens is the beavers, they do their business in the water and their feces is contaminated with the giardia and then it is ingested and that's how you get sick okay these little buggers have these little sucking discs on the end of them that allow them to attach themselves to the small intestine and um they they peristalsis doesn't shake them loose so typically it's not passed in feces for the most part um, and it can um, cause anywhere from mild diarrhea to more severe malabsorption syndromes and again the way we diagnose it is by examining the patient's stool and then the defragilis um, doesn't have a cyst stage and how it's transmitted isn't well understood, but it, they think it has something to do with the pinworm and that um, it, um, it gets help from the pinworm as far as uh, transmission goes. And then now let's talk about the ciliates. The ciliates are the most complex of protozoans uh, and they have both a cyst and trophozoite stage. Um, one of the common ones associated with humans is Balotidium coli. And uh, this little guy has some special apparati that allow it to um, do what it does. And it, uh, again, is distributed worldwide, but primarily in tropical areas. Um, not too many people um, are infected by this. Uh, swine are the primary source and then monkeys <clears throat> are a close second. But it is transmitted via the fecal oral route. Um, and then in, ingesting contaminated water or food is going to be how it's transmitted. And again, GI upset here. Abdominal pain, abdominal cramps, abdominal tenderness, nausea, watery stool, and sometimes blood or pus in the stool as well. And again, we're going to examine a stool sample um, to diagnose this um, parasite. We continue our discussion regarding parasites with Rickettsiae. And Rickettsiae is an obligate intracellular parasite. And uh, it is gram-negative pleomorphic coxobacilli. And um, it kind of splits the difference between the size of a virus and a bacterium. And uh, the reason that they are obligate intracellular parasites is that they can only replicate within the eukaryotic cell of the host because they need a rich cytoplasm um, in which to stabilize their highly permeable cell membrane. They are not motile, 
and they do not form spores. They're actually named after the man that discovered them and are divided into three groups, the typhus group, the spotted fever group, and the scrub typhus group. Uh, they, uh, let's see, rickettsiae are uh, transmitted to humans typically through bites of infected ticks or mites. And um, they, uh, they typically start by infecting the endothelium of vascular smooth muscle cells. This affects the permeability of those capillaries and can cause a collapse of the cardiovascular system. And they also may present with fever, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, hypotension, and respiratory distress. There is also a rash that accompanies the, um, the disease. Uh, typically, patients are treated with broad spectrum antibiotics and within a few days, uh, hopefully it starts to clear up. Um, so then let's talk about the three different groups. The typhus group is responsible for epidemic typhus or what they call old world typhus fever and um, it's um, typically a bite from a human body louse is what is going to transmit the disease and then symptoms include headache, uh, signs could be fever or pink spots. Um, the individual could also have chills, malaise, vomiting um, and then that could lead to shock and if it's untreated um, 30% uh, mortality rate uh, if it goes untreated. Now the scrub typhus group is caused by Orientia Tsutsugamushi. So say that five times fast. Um, it's also transmitted by a vector, a mite, and these mites live on rodents. Uh, it's pretty much similar to the typhus uh, epidemic typhus, but there's like a black area that um, that appears at the site of the bite. And if it is untreated, mortality rate is as high as 40%. And this is typically in um, seen more in Japan and Southeast Asia and the Southwest Pacific. And then spotted fever called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is caused by Rickettsia rickettsiae. And that is it, what you're looking at right here, these purplish blue polka dotty balls. Um, that's it. That's the Rickettsia rickettsii. And uh, it's transmitted by the American dog tick. And its reservoirs include a variety of animals like rabbits, birds, uh, rodents and dogs, and it is typically seen in the southeast and south central United States. And interestingly, even though its name is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, it is not very common in the Rocky Mountains. So uh, there you go. Um, similar uh, signs and symptoms here, fever, headache, fatigue, muscle pain, chills, rash. Here we are looking at some helminths in this picture here. And helminth is an example of a metazoa. And metazoas are complex multicellular organisms and they're classified in the kingdom Animalia. Included uh, in the, um, under that umbrella of metazoa are helminths, uh, ectoparasites, and arthropods. So helminths, um, there's, there's three main types and they differ in shape and size and uh, they can be free living or they can be parasitic, but helminth is the Greek word for worm. And the three types are flatworms, roundworms, and thorny headed worms. The tapeworm species um, is typically what is ingested uh, when you eat undercooked pork or beef.
ectoparasites live on the surface of the host or within its skin layer, like ticks, let's say, um, but they do not live in the internal tissues like the, the GI tract. So fleas, ticks, mites, mosquitoes, and lice are common examples of those. And these are also some examples of arthropods. Arthropods are members of Anthropoda, and they uh, can be as big as gigantic king crabs to as small as little bitty krill in the ocean. Um, but they have segmented bodies, and those bodies are protected by hard exoskeletons like bugs. You see their hard outer shells. Um, and out of the one million species of arthropods, most of them are insects, and they're some valuable pollinators as well. Um, but we're interested in them, um, and we're, we're looking at them here um, specifically um, due to their role as disease-carrying vectors. And so we're going to talk about vectors next. Vectors do not directly cause disease, but rather they spread pathogenic organisms from one host to another indirectly. So they're indirectly spreading disease, and examples of vectors include mosquitoes, flies, fleas, ticks, lice, kissing bugs, um, aquatic snails and food. So there are um, several different uh, vector-borne diseases that are currently being investigated, both viral and bacterial. And uh, there is a long list of them. Some of the viral ones include chikungunya, Dengue fever, Eastern equine encephalitis virus, Heartland virus, Japanese encephalitis, Paswan virus, St. Louis encephalitis, West Nile virus, and yellow fever. And uh, some of the more common bacterial ones are anaplasmosis. Um, and quite a few of these, I noticed, were in the United States, these vector-borne diseases. Um, but then some of them are in more um, tropical-type climates. Um, but back to the bacterial vector-borne, aside from anaplasmosis, there's Bartonella, there's babesiosis, um, Ehrlichiosis infection, Lyme disease, the plague that's caused by Y. pestis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and southern tick-associated rash illness. So all of those diseases caused by some sort of vector. And just to review the host-parasite relationships, first off, mutualism. Remember, mutualism both of the organisms that live in symbiosis benefit. And an example would be the E. coli in the intestines. It gets a benefit of having a safe place to live and we get the benefit that it produces vitamin K. Uh, commensalism. Commensalism is where one organism benefits and the other is unharmed. And the example could be the indigenous flora that lives on our body. Parasitism, again, one benefits and the other is harmed. Good example, tapeworm inside the human um, digestive tract. Ectoparasitism, these are those um, little vectors or arthropods that live on the outside of the host and um, can uh, burrow underneath the skin like mites and lice and ticks. An endoparasite is going to be the type of parasite that lives on the inside of the host, like the helminth. Um, then facultative parasites. Facultative parasites are opportunistic pathogens. So they can live independent of the host. Um, and an example here is microspora. And then lastly, incidental parasites. They um, infect species that are not a normal host. 
And an example could be this decaninum, which is a tapeworm that usually infects dogs and cats. Over time, parasites have adapted these um, resilient ways to survive in various types of environments. And so some of those mechanisms include um, their ability to be facultative, right? They can live in environments where there's oxygen or where there's not oxygen and live in situations where there's scant nutritional requirements. Think about the protozoa. The protozoa form that protective cyst. So when there are harsh conditions, it can protect itself and then it can break out of that cyst when there is a more um, inhabitable environment. They also can secrete protective enzymes or enzymes that neutralize a harsh environment. Um, again, the protozoa can develop cysts. They also have developed a special digestive organ called a peristome. Um, and uh, again, continuous changing of surface antigens um, is allowing them to evade the immune system of the host and lastly, the ability to produce, produce eggs that are resilient enough to withstand a harsh environment till they get into a situation where they can proliferate. Parasites reproduce by one of two methods, asexual reproduction or sexual reproduction. Now, uh, when we talk about asexual reproduction, there are three different methods and that is mitotic fission, schizogony, and budding. And mitotic fission, you can think of that like mitosis. This is when the protozoa divides and it produces two uh, exact daughter cells. Schizogony is when the nucleus divides several times and then the cytoplasm is distributed equally among those daughter cells. And then budding uh, helminths can um, asexually reproduce through the process of budding, which um, allows several um, worms to bud from one single egg. Sexual reproduction, on the other hand, is more efficient than asexual reproduction because we have that um, shuffle of genetic material, right? So um, they have an ability to genetically adapt to their changing environment better, which increases the survival of their species. So some protozoans, they re reproduce by conjugation. Remember, we talked about this with bacteria, how there's a cell-to-cell -cell contact and then genetic information is transferred from one cell to the other. Uh, another type is uh, through cross-fertilization or um, self-fertilization. And this uh, can occur with uh, trematodes and cestodes, they can um, they can either self fertilize or cross fertilize. They have both male and female reproductive organs. The life cycle of the parasite consists of two different types of cycles: the complex life cycle and the simple life cycle. And the complex life cycle basically means that they have to rely on more than one host. So some of them have to have an intermediate host. And then the simple life cycle means that these parasites are transmitted by direct contact or ingestion. And then there they are, they're inside the host. Routes of infection for parasites include contaminated water um, or food, and this could include um, poor sanitary systems, contaminated drinking water, poor hygiene practices. It can also occur through direct contact between people, arthropods, and vectors 
are uh, as vectors are also ways that parasites get transmitted. We talked about that before. Inhalation is another way. When the um, parasitic eggs become airborne, they can be inhaled and they can enter the host that way. Uh, and then the other route of infection is transplacental infection. Malaria is considered the most common parasitic infection uh, worldwide in humans. Uh, there's an estimated 660,000 people that die from malaria annually, um, predominantly in other countries. Um, uh, the CDC reports that malaria was eradicated in the United States in the 1950s, um, but education and treatment um, and large-scale intervention in those areas where it is uh, more um, prolific, um, that has helped to reduce the death rate by 45% in the last 10 years. So that is really good. Uh, malaria is transmitted uh, via mosquito and um, there was a time when there was transmission through donated blood products. So um, blood donors that live in non-endemic areas but have traveled to endemic areas, uh, they suggest that you don't donate blood for at least one year following travel if you don't have any symptoms. Neglected tropical diseases are a group of parasitic and bacterial diseases that cause substantial illness for more than 1 billion people all over the world, uh, affecting the world's poorest population. Um, neglected tropical diseases um, cause physical and cognitive impairments and contribute to mother and child illness and death, make it difficult for people um, that farm uh, to earn a living, limit productivity in the workplace. And uh, some examples that the book gives us, uh, first one is Chagas disease, uh, which is um, typically found in Mexico, Central America, and South America. And it is carried by a bug um, called the triatamine bug. And the parasite lives in the bug's feces and uh, the bug bites you, and then the feces get rubbed into the bite, and that allows it to enter the tissues. Um, another one, uh, Tania solium causes uh, cystocerocosis, and that is typically in African Asia. Dengue fever is caused by mosquitoes, and it is the leading cause of illness and death in the tropics and subtropics. Guinea worm disease, is um, a parasitic infection that you get by drinking contaminated water um, that have water fleas that have swallowed the larva of the guinea worms. Uh, in addition to that, there are parasitic flukes. Um, and these, uh, this mainly occurs where there are sheep and cattle farms, and uh, the infection rates are the highest in areas like Peru and Bolivia, where water, uh, where it gets passed through the sheep and the cattle species, and then the water gets contaminated with the larva. Um, Trypanosmiasis uh, is called the sleeping sickness, and it is caused by a parasite that is found in different areas in Africa. Uh, phlebetomine sand flies um, are a vector that spread um, a disease found mainly in the subtropics called leishmania. And um, this, um, this disease is typically found in the tropics, subtropics, southern Europe, and Latin America. Onchocerciasis is also known as river blindness and it is caused by larva from a particular type of worm and uh, what happens is the worms embed themselves in the skin 
and they cause really severe itching and lesions. And sometimes th this is referred to as lizard, lizard or leopard skin. And they can get into the blood, these worms, and migrate to the eyes. And if they do, that is what causes the blindness. Um, 37 million people are infected and 99% of those people live in Africa. Schizomyosis uh, or snail fever. Um, if you think the snail is to blame, you would be right. Um, the eggs uh, of this parasite get sh uh, shed in the feces and urine of infected animals into the water where the snails live and they infest the snails in there. They grow and develop and then they leave the snail and go back into the water and contaminate the water. And then when the water gets ingested, that's how the host gets sick. Um, and then lastly, soil transmitted helminths, uh, specifically talking about hookworms, whipworms, um, and they're responsible for infecting more than 1 billion people uh, in the world. Um, however, better sanitation practices have greatly reduced those infections, and uh, they are now uh, fairly rare in the United States. So that concludes our discussion regarding parasites and vectors. I hope that you found it helpful. And I'm looking forward to our next lecture, which will be about mycology. Stay tuned. It's going to be awesome.